thing. You ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Welcome to the race recap with uh, Big Mike here and the Pixie. Today, uh, we're going to be interviewing Liza Ricchetto, and I'll pass it off to, uh, to the Pixie to get started. Okay. Well, what we're trying to do with this podcast is we're trying to hear from incredible athletes like Liza here. Um, so they're going to tell us a little bit about the inside scoop of the race and what makes them tick and why they do such incredible things or how they do such incredible things. So to kind of kick us off, Liza, tell us a little bit about your career. In triathlon specifically? When you're cycling, let's start with that. All right, will do. So I began racing bikes in Boise, Idaho, my hometown. And I gradually worked my way up to Cat One license and a professional. And I moved to Italy in 2004. I've raced on teams since then, mostly in the U.S., but two and a half years in Italy. And two of those years I took, I still raced, but I took some time off because I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So it wow. took me a while to get my health figured out and being on the right medications. And then I went back to race at the highest elite level. And I've decided that this was my final season. Wow. 17 years as a pro cyclist. Absolutely incredible. So tell us a little bit more about your rheumatoid arthritis. You know, as we were getting ready to speak to you, Mike and I were discussing how incredible um, that being able to manage that is. And being able to compete at the level. Yes, and <laughs> compete at that level. Yeah. You know, tell bit about how that works for you I think it was it was very difficult initially when I had the diagnosis and I planned to completely give up you know any um, competition and figure out how I could manage the symptoms so I sort of went into a directing role for a team in the Bay Area and my doctor actually was a former Olympian in cycling, and she really thought I would never be able to race at an elite level. And so you can imagine the depression and that set in, and I didn't even know if I could run a 5K. And so some of these things back in 2007, 2008 were, you know, helped me make some decisions for the future. Um, during that time, I was fortunate enough to meet my husband. And what I will say is, as you know, you know, having Mike as your support is, he helped me tremendously keep my stress down, um, allow me to be able to build my health back up because I sort of did the opposite things. I went and I started working a lot and not eating well and everything declined. But as so there's different medications that you can go on. And I was on a methotrexate and um, another one that you know, help decrease the flare ups in my joints, but they didn't completely go away. So I was able to build back fitness and strength and start to compete, but it was very challenging. I have always needed more sleep than my teammates. I have particular things about my diet that I do, and I'm just not able to have like the, you know, the energy sort of outside of training and racing that a lot of people do, but my husband has, has helped me and been able to support me through, gosh, it's been, you know, over 12 years. So eventually getting towards 2016, 2017, had some, every year I have x-rays and I have, you know, blood panels and my doctor said, your joints are degrading faster than I would like obviously a little depressing, you know, you're in your off season, ready for the next year. Yeah. So was put on, um, a biologic, um, the name of the biologic is called Symphony. Uh, and she was hoping this was going to be a lot better solution than, um, the previous medication I was on. Fortunately, you know, what's amazing about just, um, technology and, you know, new drugs and, and helping people with their health it stopped um, the degradation of my joints. And right now they're, it's somewhat in remission. Uh, I, I still do have flare-ups, um, but they're more 
related to my cycle than actual like um, other reasons. And um, and since and so that was really about um, beginning of 2017, and it took a few months for for the biologic to really get in my system and start working. And um, I noticed I didn't have to sleep, you know, 10, 11 hours a night. I could sleep eight and feel like I was recovered and. Um, if you'd been my teammate, you know, in years past, I would carry around ice packs and I'm constantly like taping body parts that are flaring up. And <laughs> I actually had rock my sponsor for a couple years and yeah, I just would finish races. Um, actually the second time I finished Hawaii, I was nearly going to the podium or the, actually I wasn't on the podium, but I was walking around the house, uh, with a walker. Um, because my what? ankles, my knees were so swollen. So it's a part of, you know, the recovery or the, the training that people don't often see unless they're around me a lot. Um, and the flare ups have been, you know, I mean, I've had chronic pain for a good decade or so, but, uh, I'm grateful now, you know, just to be able to manage it and not have those flare ups and recover better. But, you know, like all things, all good things have to come to an end at some point. And, you know, being 47, definitely, you know, I've maxed out my years as a professional bike racer and I really wanted to go out on my own terms and, you know, keep my health and balancing the racing with the coaching just continued to kind of become a little bit more difficult along with wanting to spend time with family and, yeah. friends, you know, my husband. So that's the long and short of it. <laughs> and sticking a little bit with the uh, pro cycling career there, while you've been a pro cyclist, uh, I saw you did the Giro d'Italia. Yep, I've done the Giro d'Italia three times. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And that was probably before and after you I were did diagnosed. It, I did it in 2009, 2012, and 2016. So kind of broken up. And the first year was with an Italian team. The second year was with the composite team. And the third year was with a, a U.S. team. And we went over. Yeah. Okay. Wow. For those out there who don't know that what that is, you know, can you tell a little bit about that event? Absolutely. There are very few races. In fact, currently that's the only one that ha is the longest. Um, so depending upon the year, it's between nine and 10 days. Uh, there might be, actually, I don't even know if we had a rest day, but typically is uh, road races anywhere from 60 miles to about 82 miles. And then either an individual time trial or a team time trial. And, you know, the other added thing is it's not all in one place. You're either going from Northern Italy down to the South. So you're different place every single day, or you're working your way up, going from Southern Italy up to the North. Oh my gosh. I bet that was incredible writing. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. And people ask me, do you get to get a chance to look around? And I said, well, eventually when I drop from the main group, I can kind of enjoy it. <laughs> I'm still suffering, but it is pretty spectacular. Yeah, I I can only I've never ridden in, in Italy. I rode in France and it was incredible, but I feel like it's pretty technical, so you kind of have to pay attention. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, let's kind of shift back about triathlon because you had mentioned that your friends and family members are kind of involved. How did you hear about it? I feel like so many stories um, of people in this sport hear from a friend or watch an event and they just get ex extremely wrapped up in it. So tell us a little bit about how you got involved in triathlon. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I was a collegiate swimmer, not a, not a freestyler. I was a sprinter, a breaststroker. Oh, but dang. I had a good friend that uh, was a volunteer and she would come to our swim meets and help out. And she said, you know, you're from Boise. There's a number of triathletes there. It's a great community. Maybe when you're done with school, you can kind of get into that. And I thought, yeah, that sounds like something kind of fun. And this woman, Christy Kincaid, back in 1996, you know, took me on my first bike ride. It was like 40 miles and I thought I was going to die. 
<laughs> it's been like so long and I was so tired. I was laying on the floor, you know, of my apartment. I couldn't even move. And <laughs> let me ask, were you on a road bike or a mountain bike? It's kind of like your first jaunting into true. I was on a road bike. I did oh, Yeah, really my, first, my first road bike in 1995. And um, you know, I have very specific specific memories getting a bike. <laughs> And telling my friends, oh, I think I'm going to do a triathlon. And I pull up to the coffee shop. I'm clipped into these pedals and I just completely tip over. And they're like, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> See how that's going to go. Uh, I, I love that story. I feel like, you know, so, so many people who start in the sport, um, so many people who start in the sport, uh, you know, you, those distances seem so daunting originally. Um, you know, I think that I thinking about running a marathon about six years ago sounded like the worst possible thing I could do ever. Um, so if you are giving somebody advice, who's just getting into the sport about kind of being scared about the distances, what would you say to those people? I think the main thing, especially as a coach, is, 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 first of all, having a mentor, a coach, or a close friend that has the experience and done those events is incredibly important. And gaining knowledge off of them, as you know, you have a fantastic coach, Rebecca McGee. Those people are so important and they're pivotal in your training and your preparation because often people look at the distance and they are overwhelmed but you have to break it down for them you have to give them small goals in order for them to get to that long distance or build up to that that training to have them complete that event and you know a majority of it is the mindset mm -hmm. I think that's the thing when people go from like the half iron man to the full it's you get into those distances and and suffering or whatever for that time it's all mental you got the physical thing i mean as humans we can push ourselves much much farther than we think and that's where the mental side comes in so yeah i would say you prove that with just overcoming ra i mean so many people i mean you're competing it the highest level at both Ironman distance triathlon and pro cycling. Thanks. <laughs> um, it's, it's so impressive to, to hear that. And I do agree with you as getting a coach. I think that that is really, really important to be able to break those things down. Sometimes like they're seemingly impossible at one point. And then when you have somebody help you break it down into smaller pieces, it's. And, and I see that you're a coach as well. Love to hear a little more about that dynamic. Why don't you just say, hey, I can coach myself. Why would you hire somebody else? No way. <laughs> I've tried that. I've been there. Uh, I'll tell you two important things. One, when I attempted to do that in 98, 99, I had a knee injury and, you know, I should have backed off and I didn't and I got injured. And I just consistently did a lot of dumb things that I could have saved myself from had I had a coach the first couple of years. And secondly, you just, I need that person in my life to bounce off the training. Like even sometimes if I think I could do something better myself, I follow the plan because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to have to think about it. And, um, you know, it's just, it's easier. Yeah. So yeah. been there, done that, better with the coach. <laughs> Absolutely. Excellent. Okay. Um, and for those out there who might be already doing triathlons but that don't have coach, what that don't have a coach, what advice would you give those athletes who are trying to find that right fit? Right fit for a coach? Yeah, for like an athlete and their needs, like how would you go about coach shopping? I think, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. It's very important. I primarily take athletes that are referred to me um, 
your current athletes. So word of mouth, um, even though I have a website and I, I don't really do any advertising because oftentimes my current athletes, they know my personality, they know my type of coaching. And so they can relay that information to that person. And then that person can decide, okay, it sounds like this is going to be something that works for me. And um, you can always go on USA Triathlon, USA Cycling, you know, obviously Google and the web. Um, I, I did, there is one time that I had to find a coach short term. And I went to my friends that were at a high level nutritionists and coaches and said, look, I've, I've got this event. I've got two months. Who do you think would be best for me? And I ended up choosing a coach in a program that worked fantastic. And hmm. again, it was kind of a word of mouth thing. Um, I also needed someone that was somewhat local at the time. Hmm. But what I will also say is... Um, I've had, I've only had really three coaches in 21 years. Is that right? Three and 20 wow. years. And the first I, I worked under Wenzel coaching um, when I started my career and was brand new. And that was fantastic. And then as I started to turn pro, I needed someone that was going to be around a little bit more and I could get tested um, from in person. And so that person, that coach is in California. And that same coach I've had for 16 years. And then, like I said, there was only one other coach I had for two months that was also based in San Francisco, um, Purple Patch, Matt Dixon. So of those three coaches, you know, for me at this point in my life and probably the last 10 years is that person knows me incredibly well. They know my numbers. They know exactly what I'm capable of in triathlon and in cycling as well. And, and that probably, you know, I'm a unique person is I need sort of someone with knowledge in both of those areas specifically. So um, it's uh, it's definitely important, I think, to shop around, but I'm a big word of mouth person. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, do you have any uh, words of wisdoms for like, if there's like a red flag for coaches, like, don't go, don't do that. <laughs> that person. <laughs> Oh, if, if someone's looking for a coach? Yeah. Um, I guess there's definitely two, like, two things. Like, if you're very much into numbers, power, watts, you're a very, very technical person, you need to find a coach that's going to be able to match that. Mm -hmm. If you're someone that needs, um, we, we call it kind of the cheerleader coach, someone to encourage you. Um, sports psychology, you know, that, that mental part, um, you need to find someone that's good at that. Okay. And so I, those are two, to me, those are the very two kind of separating things. Um, if you need that encouragement and you have someone that's more into numbers, it's not going to work. If you have someone that's, you know, encouraging and doesn't really do the numbers, then it's you know not going to work. Yeah. Makes I think that's great advice. Uh, lights went out. <laughs> yeah. So try to find someone, as you said, maybe word of mouth, you know, somebody that's really going to fit your attitude. Yeah. Uh, and interviewing yeah. that coach and, you know, I have a history intake form and a lot of times I can tell within five minutes of reading that athlete, if I think they're going to be a good fit for me as well. And if I don't, there's been times where I have a lot of court coaches, you know, in my network then I'll refer them to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I would say the biggest thing is if it's a newer athlete and they need skills on the bike, they need someone to see you. They need someone locally, especially initially. And if not, um, there's a way that, you know, there's some ways around that you might hire people for one-offs, swim lessons, run mm -hmm. technique, bike technique. And so I like doing, you know, for me, typically, I like doing a lot of skills on the bike in person. For swimming, I have multiple other coaches that I bring in and work with my athletes, um, along with running, nutrition, you know, all those things. So I don't do all of that myself. Okay. That's great advice. Uh, well, 
we do want to remember to certainly ask about the race recap. If this is going to be the race recap. <laughs> That's right. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you've been in this sport and professional cycling for so long. I feel like we could go on a long time. <laughs> yeah, take here. a long time. <laughs> so um, I see you qualified um, for uh, 70.3 St. George World Championships at Santa Cruz. Um, and then, you know, there was a whole lot that happened to uh, us athletes there before the race. So one of my big questions for you is what did you feel like you were anticipating but actually didn't happen during the race? <laughs> oh, the heat for sure. So when did that hit you? Because, you know, for everybody that's out there, um, Liza started at 9.51 p.m. She was the very a.m. A.m. <laughs> she started at night. <laughs> You're getting crazy at this point. Yeah. Um, so the pros started at 7 a.m. The pro men, pro women started at 7 10. Uh, Liza, your age group was the last one to go at 9 51. Final one. Yep. Yeah. What was just, it like yeah, before take you got in the all of this? Because it's, it's so different from each each person, each way. It, it is very different. And when I first saw the start list, and the times come out, I had this big hole in my stomach. <laughs> like, oh, really? So I'm going to be doing a half marathon at 2 p.m. when it's like 95 degrees. I'm like, that is going to hurt. And again, back to the mental side of things, all I could think about was, all right, we've done 10 criteriums, bike races, and it has never been cooler than 85 degrees so you got this like you suffered through the heat and even though i have a few events before the run <laughs> um, you know uh one of the things that's important that i have a majority of my athletes do is um, a heat training protocol so dr stacy sims um has set up basically you can do sauna training and then there's other ways with hot bath and um preparing yourself to get ready for the environment. So I did that for nine days. Uh, it does help. It is exhausting. <laughs> Three days before the race, I'm like, well, heat is probably not going to be my problem anymore. <laughs> um, however, it does help a little bit for altitude. And be because I've been at sea level for eight weeks, I thought, you know, it's it, it'll still help. And yeah, in the morning, I went ahead and got on those shuttle buses a little bit earlier than I had planned because there was about 45 an hour wait. And I figured let's just get there and brought, I mean, I was eating pancakes on the shuttle bus, <laughs> brought all kinds of gear with me, my swim warm up stuff and, and took my time getting my bike ready. And I think even the porta potty line was about half an hour, but oh my gosh, in a way, you know, I, I feel like almost on the day, it's either better to go first or go last. Because by the time everybody was, like, out of transition, uh, we had all this place, and it was kind of quiet, you know, on the pavement. There were no porta potty lines. Uh, but it was, yeah. It was interesting because then the sun starts to come out. And I'm like, great, this is just what I bought my husband an umbrella for. So, standing under this umbrella, you know, the sun's kind of starting to warm us up. And then all I remember is, you know, exiting the swim or probably 300 meters. I'm like, to go, I'm feeling like hail or something is coming down on me. And then the water is just. Oh up. my gosh. I'm like, oh, we got to get out of here. We got to get out. I don't know what's going on. You know, and you get out and just like, everything's blown over, right? We're running through the bike transition because the barriers to get to T1 are blown over. And you know, I typically push my bike by the seat. And as soon as I made my way through these women and I'm pushing the bike, you know, the front wheel can't take it. So it's just like, you know, going sideways. And um, the video my husband got was just fantastic of sort of the whole um, action out of T1 because stuff's going crazy. and. Um, yeah, it was no longer 
hot and sunny. <laughs> <laughs> and he 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 everything flying around. What's that? Sorry, did he catch you exiting T1 or did he catch everything flying around? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I'm sure as Carolyn experienced, you know, the winds in the rain on the bike were pretty, they're pretty epic. I, I will say, you know, I've had a lot of bike races with very cold or very windy conditions. And um, yeah, it, it sucked. And so... I honestly was super happy because if I'm not going to do well, like in terms of like fitness wise, technically it's going to be a great race for me on the bike and, you know, passing people and figuring out where to put down power and where to back off and where to eat on that course. I think those are the 10 and 30 second gains or minutes that you can lose. It yeah. Just on your skills and it'd be the same way along with the terrain and altitude not a lot of people may be exposed you can't learn you can't do this kind of thing on swift right no way yeah. uh, it just you know and that's how i feel about kona you get out there and if it's windy you should have been riding rollers with a massive fan on you blowing sideways so that you have to um, because even the small muscles, like in your shoulders and your arms, conditioning those to ride in that condition takes a whole different, you know, thing. Oh, yeah. I um, I actually had bruises on my left um, elbow oh, yeah. from leaning into the wind so hard. Yeah. I was shocked. I could feel it in my obliques. <laughs> 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 now you know what it was like in men's rope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, okay. So it was raining probably. I mean, so when did you start getting sunshine on the course? I mean, you're such a phenomenal rider. I mean, that's a huge advantage for you technically. Cause I, I noticed definitely if people weren't, you know, I've raced a lot in Hawaii and you have too. So the wind for people that have that experience was pretty, pretty um, advantageous, I would say. Um, but when did you start getting that heat? Because when I came into the finish line, it started to warm up. Yeah, it wasn't until the whole second lap of the run. Been hot. Yeah. And I think that's what's so funny is how the weather was and swim, the bike. And then when I grabbed my T2 bag, I was almost laughing because I'm like, oh, I got arm coolers. I've got an Omnius, you know, head cooler. I've got my hat, and I looked at everything. I'm like, I don't need any of that. Like, <laughs> and the sunglasses. I only took my sunglasses because I thought, I guess if it rains again, I can have eye protection. <laughs> yeah. So I left all that in the bag, and um, yeah, it just pummeled rain. Um, you were probably on the run as well. You know, one of the laps in the beginning. And then the sun came out and got super hot. So, yeah. Wow. I I think I just love hearing that different perspective. I mean, you and I were only, wait, what time did I go? I was 30 minutes ahead of you when I started. And I just think it was just such a completely unique race for everyone um, on that day. You know, you just like you said, you have arm warmers, a head cooler. You know, you just weren't sure what the heck was going to hit you at any moment. Had you raced St. George before this? Never. No. Nope. Right. Uh, I had done a bike race in 2001. Oh. And I had trained my coach, my very first coach at the time, lived in St. George. Yeah, we loved it. We loved it in St. George. I would go back. Well, I just asked because I know Rebecca, she uh, she curses St. George's name. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, championships has happened to her before i think it snowed on her yes and then she said it's as okay. soon as it <laughs> finished it was like a thousand degrees and she's like no i'm never going back <laughs> well and carol and, and i both raced there in may and other than the cold water in the reservoir i don't think you could have asked for it it was a perfect day that's great yeah that's great hopefully that bodes well for 2022 that's all <laughs> <laughs> um well you know thank you so much for sharing anything else you want to share about 
crazy that happened to you in the race? Gosh, you know, I think it's interesting when you say that. I think it's just the mental fortitude and attitude and all the racing I've done over the years. I've had a lot of crazy things happen. And so to me, it was just like another race day. with. <laughs> yeah. um, and we don't want to go into the, the many yeah, triathlons and races I've done with very crazy things happening. But I was overall incredibly impressed by Ironman, how the roads were closed. For me, yeah. safety is a very, very important thing. And so I felt safe the entire day. And I felt like, you know, maybe on a hotter day, I think maybe a few more aid stations. I'd say maybe one more on the bike and one more on the run. Mm -hmm. 3,500, I don't know if you're aware, but 3,500 people is the largest one-day race they've actually ever had. Oh. Yeah. Andrew Meisick was uh, talking to us about this. So that many people on one course, you know, if it had been hotter, you know, hopefully they they could have managed it as well. But, um, and I, of course saw, you know, unfortunately people had crashed. So I saw a number, a number of ambulances, but there was nothing that was like a roadblock or, you know, incredibly dangerous. And, um, and what they did with bringing 80 women out of the water into boats, you know, I mean, having, it, it's unfortunate that, you know, two people have died in St. George, you know, racing. So having, that I think was uh, fantastic. It was very smart of them to do that. Yeah, I I don't know how many people knew about that. I learned that after the race that they pulled. I thought it was seventy, so it was eighty women out of the water. Yeah. Wow. There were um, they were mostly from the last three waves. Yeah. So what they allowed them to do is they swam the first half. If they had made it around and were coming back, they could finish. But if they hadn't gotten to basically the halfway point, they put them in boats. Um, okay. Yep. So, so, they, I think so those that were over halfway, they allowed them to continue on with the bike. Anybody who wasn't uh, was- No, the take... ones in the boat, they still let them finish. Oh, they still let them finish? Yeah, yeah. So when they were over halfway, they let them finish swimming. Yeah. Those in the boat, correct. they still, okay. Yeah, correct. Which I think is really awesome. I think they yeah. just they just dropped them off over the timing mat and on they went. Yep. yep. Incredible. Um well let's go into um a little bit about some advice you'd give some people. Um actually I want to leave that question for the end. Well, um, I do want to ask because yeah. I, I know you, neither of you mentioned this, but I saw, you know, you, you performed amazingly well. got second here. Yeah, I don't think we called that out. <laughs> second for your championship. So congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, was, I, I, I was trying to do a little bit of research and I couldn't find any. Was this your first 70.3 world championship? It was, correct. That's what? correct. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot better you could have done. <laughs> yeah, it's one place, you know. <laughs> yeah, for, for everybody else out there, she's also podium five times at Kona, which is an amazing feat. I feel like that's a, it's almost just a dream to get there for a majority of us athletes. It's just like, oh my God, I made it. You're actually podiuming at Kona. So we tried to do a little bit of research. So what was your... I see you got second in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Your, is that your best show? Best result, correct. I think so my best time was 2018. Okay. I don't even know what it was. Fourth there. Yeah. That's absolutely phenomenal. So with you, are you changing gears to focus a little bit more on triathlon? Yes. So um, I'm not retiring from sport completely. <laughs> I and it's mainly a part of my coaching so because I have athletes that are racing triathlon next year I'm focusing on races that they're attending so those same races you know kind of similar to you and Rebecca um I'll be doing those and then um so we have sort of the first half of the year planned out along with doing some uh camps you know with uh triathlon road and gravel 
That is awesome. So um, do you have any, uh, are you, do you have any aspirations of winning first in your age group for? Oh, for sure. <laughs> I'll tell you, to be honest, I think my coach would be more excited than actually I would. Because <laughs> he always says, we got to win this thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we'll get there someday. <laughs> I mean, I understand the enthusiasm. You're getting close. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's like, let's yeah. go. Yeah. Man, I'm so impressed by, by this. I keep, you know, I just think it's, we have so many uh, gems in this sport and in particular in this area around us. And I'm, I'm always blown away to hear these stories. And then when I dig a little deeper, I'm like, wow, this person, I thought they were super incredible. And then I actually started to look back at their track record and I'm like, <laughs> tiny little mind blown. Um, but you're paving the way for the rest of us. So, um, let's talk about, uh, you and, your dream race. So if you were, we, I see in here that you would love to do Lanzarote. You bet. Lanzarote. My bad. I'm saying it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Mike can give me some advice on the bike. Um, I hope it's technical. Oh yeah. Great. Is the wind is consistent <laughs> and predictable. <laughs> So when it's blowing straight at your face, it's not going to stop. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it's, that race has always intrigued me because of the climbing and because of the terrain. And I've never been to that part of um, Spain. So wait, Canary Islands. Yeah. Yes, which is part of Spain. Okay. Okay. It is. Okay. Good. Got to get my geography down here. Um, <laughs> So yeah, those are things that intrigue me about that race for sure. And I think, you know, I, I've been lucky to do races that don't exist anymore. Like Ironman, like Tahoe was absolutely one of my favorites. And, you know, bike races, there was San Francisco Grand Prix and um, the Philly Classic and the Bermuda Grand Prix. So, um, you know, all those don't exist, but definitely for triathlon, Lanzarote is something I, you know, someday I hope to get there. Yeah. They say the toughest on, on the world. I can attest to it. Yeah, <laughs> then, then again, I've only done one. So for me, yeah, everything it was else from here is easy. But yeah. That, that's, so I hear. <laughs> Well, um, I hope you get there. I know that, you know, now that I watched him do it, I'm like, God damn it. Now I got to go do it. He did it. So I got to go do it. <laughs> so it, it, it's really incredible that Mirador de Rio is just incredible going up on that seascape and you just look down. I mean, I thought that we were going to die <laughs> the entire time, but. Um, once you wrote it, it felt a little safer. <laughs> oh, you ride along cliffs that you don't want to fall over. Nice. <laughs> it. It's overall pretty safe. Uh, the wind's usually blowing against it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then kind of some more fun questions for you. Since all of us triathletes, I feel, or a majority of us triathletes are completely addicted to coffee. How do you take your top? How do you take your coffee? I'm pretty simple. I, I like an Italian Lavazza, and I usually have it in an Aeropress. Ooh. Like, what is know, an Aeropress? Are you familiar with it, Mike? No. Yeah, what is an Aeropress? How would I describe it? A lot of cyclists travel with them, oh. um, and it's it's basically like does a shot of, it looks like a shot of espresso when it comes out, but yeah, it just does the extraction period you know, a little bit faster, but you have to do it manually. Oh. Similar to a French yeah. press, but less? You know, yeah, in a way, but it has like a filter though. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, we'll have to look into this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Kind of a little more caffeine because the water is essentially sitting longer with the coffee grounds. Okay, we're definitely going to have to look into this. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I feel like everywhere I go, I learn something new about coffee and then I'm hooked on it and I'm like, woo, how can I have even more energy? <laughs> um, and then your favorite book. 
So one of the books I read, well, recently I actually read Digital Minimalism. Now, this isn't something I can always follow because social media is an important part of my life, but I do like to take breaks because I think it's super healthy. Yeah. So that's probably my most recent favorite book, but I'm always interested in, you know, those inspirational books um, like Endurance and ones that are, you know, autobiographies, you know, famous athletes or people that have done expeditions. Yeah. Oh, what do you have a athlete that you look up to? Is there one, you know, bio that you've read that you really loved? That is a tough question. I'm sure you've read a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, probably one of my most recent is Carly Lloyd, um, soccer player. Number handful of cyclists. Yeah, I mean I think the most interesting thing is a lot of I guess cyclists in my that are my friends have had fascinating things. You know, mm -hmm. Armstrong. Um I have a couple friends that just, you know, retired, finished the world championships and they've just gone to the Olympics a handful of times. So mm -hmm. There's a lot of friends that I have, you know, in my personal group or circle that I look up to. Yeah, I uh, I saw that cute little um, recording from Kristen Armstrong to you for your yeah. retirement. I was like, oh, yeah. she's so cool. They're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then I think this is, I love to ask this question for people, but who inspires you? Oh, my mom, for sure. Her what? amount of energy and, and just her, um, she's 75, probably rides with twice a day, 10 miles each time. What? Oh, yeah, a couple times. Along with doing yard projects and painting the house multiple times and <laughs> playing hello and um, taking lessons. And, you know, those are just like a few of the things outside of being a grandmother and taking care of my nieces and nephews and she um is a pretty high level active person so you said she cycles did she cycle or, so it's cycling in the family no it's not no she, <laughs> no no not at all uh, <laughs> i was a ski racer and i did a little bit of golf and tennis and swimming when i was younger but i found bikes in college and nobody in my family really raced or rode but we did get my mom on Zwift about four years ago, and she just loved it. And so it was a great way for her, you know, to get in some cardio at home and not have to go, especially during the pandemic, not have to go to the YMCA Yeah, and have her little routine. So I'm very happy that, yeah, that she's got that going. What a blessing to be able to have her join, you know, enjoy the same things that you enjoy and be able to participate in those. I think that that's really... Um, you know, my, my father, uh, bike rides and I actually haven't been able to ride with him as much, but when I was younger, you know, just getting into biking, I was able to participate with that with him. And it, it means a lot to be able to do that. And I'm sure it means a lot to her to be able to watch you in all your successes. Oh yeah. She loves it. She loves, she says, Oh, when you go around those corners, you're going to stick out your knee again. <laughs> <laughs> Does she go with you? Does she travel to go see you? She's traveled to a couple races and she always goes to the Boise Twilight. And then because a lot of our races are live streamed, she'll always watch those. I love that. Mm, I, I, it makes me, I'm like, my mommy, she comes, <laughs> she, you know, she's like, I get so scared for you, but I'm always going to be there. <laughs> um, and then... I always like to ask this because I feel like all of us have to have our own little playlist while we're, we're working out. We have to have our motivation. What is your favorite song at this moment? Because I feel like mine is like rotating favorite song. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've got, well, I would say like I'd probably go with some of my favorite artists like Tiesto or Katy Perry. Yes. Or I'm a big Lady Gaga fan. Yes. So. I'm this way, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and honestly, I'm not I'm not great at um, you know knowing songs really well or finding them. So that's where I rely on a lot of my younger teammates that are in their twenties. 
and I, you know, steal music from them. And um, a lot of it's kind of vulgar these days, but anyways, it's good. Yeah, like... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, if you go to you know like the today's top hits on Spotify, I think that can <laughs> keep you up to date. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I need to do. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, you know, I think that kind of like wrapping up with our last two questions. Um, I think that you know the people who are watching, how has triathlon enhanced your life? So you know, what what is it about that this this the sport that is given to you? I would say back when I started in 97, 98, and I was finishing college, going into that transition of becoming an adult, making new friends in Boise, I found this community of athletes and people that healthy, that I really enjoyed spending time with. And what's really difficult is when you come from a team sport and then all of a sudden you're kind of on your own, but yet with triathlon and sort of a community outside of work, I um, found these people that I wanted to hang out with and do weekend trips and do races with. And so the social part was really important to me, um, staying healthy and fit because I really didn't have any goals when I finished college. Mm. And, you know, now a lot of that's changed because it's, it's actually my career as a coach. And now, you know, the, being able to coach people and mentor them and, you know, inspire them for those goals. You know, a lot of my racing and what I do is sort of like that example of someone that's not had a healthy body or been healthy all the time, but yet I've not given up, you know. Mm -hmm. And trying to inspire people that, you know, and the theme is anything is possible. And so even if you're told you may never run 5K, you may never race as an elite athlete, not necessarily true. You know, things can change and um, having a positive attitude and, you know, finding that community in the sport, I think is really important for people. Yeah. Uh as a last question, I definitely want to know, and I think you kind of touched on it there, uh, what do you do to help motivate yourself, you know, if maybe you're not up to it, uh, or even your athletes, if, you know, your athletes, I don't know, aren't hitting their workouts, or they're just telling you, like, you know, I've, I've lost my motivation, how, how do you find that? How do you help your athletes find their motivation? I would have to say, you know, getting diagnosed with RA in, in 2007, when I had trouble getting out of bed, when I was in a ton of pain and I couldn't do things, that I have to constantly remind myself, there's someone else that's injured and they cannot work out and they cannot train and you have no excuses. Like you have, you have the time, you have, you know, the equipment and the opportunity, you need to go do it. And with motivating my athletes, you know, um, it can be a variety of different ways. And I think it actually is very personal for each one of them. And that's something I feel like I kind of specialize in is each person, it's going to take a different thing for them to tick and get out the door or complete their training. And, you know, there is nothing like having an injury and being down. And then when you come out of it and you get healthy and you realize, I can do this now. There's no reason I shouldn't. And so when a lot of people do get depressed, like it's actually a good reset, I think, to motivate you later for when you are healthy. And um, one of the things that's actually unique, uh, I have my athletes do more specifically in an Ironman, because a lot of times you're suffering kind of hard in the marathon, is I... Uh, take 26 people that have suffered. I might cry now, but I'm trying not to <laughs> that have suffered in the past year, either a loss, um, a family member, cancer, something that has been pretty drastic. Um, or I've seen that person in, at some point in their career, you know, suffer or maybe, or maybe just inspire me. 
and I write down those 26 people and I often have them at the harder you know, people that have suffered the most, they're in those tough miles between 22 and 26. Um, yep. <laughs> I usually have my family members in the beginning, uh, like the first six miles and my husband. And each mile, I think this person has suffered this year. They'll suffer for 10 years. I can suffer for one freaking mile. Like, suck it up. And that's how I get through the marathon. And I tell my athletes, you know, I, you know, maybe you don't have to think of 26 people. Sometimes when you're tired, you might think of somebody for two miles. <laughs> but uh, it's so important. And, and if that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what does, you know, uh, because, you know, as, as a healthy athlete, you're out there inspiring someone and someone is going to get off the couch because we've seen you do something that maybe you didn't even know you could do. And so that's important to remember. Oh, that that's incredibly inspiring. And I mean, I was going to say the mental acuity to remember 26 different <laughs> people there. <laughs> yep, uh, yep. Wow. Uh, that's a surefire way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that's beautiful, you know, kind of pus- putting, uh, putting something other than yourself as a goal, you know, thinking outside your body is also very, I think that that is extremely empowering. You know, we've had a family member this year that has become very ill, Mike, Mike's dad. Um, and, you know, he's been a huge um, point of motivation for both of us. Yeah. So, so we can relate. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I have, we've absolutely loved talking to you, you know, from your huge accomplishments in cycling, your podium finishes at Ironman and your very first podium finish at 70.3 Worlds. Um, you know, if for those of you that are, for those that are listening out there, you know, how can they find you? How can they follow you if they want to watch your journey? Yeah, Liza Coach is my Instagram handle. LizaCoaching.com is my website. Liza Ricchetto and Liza Coaching are my Facebook um, information. I'm not really on Twitter very much or some of the other ones, TikTok and whatnot. But um, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram are my two big social medias. And then uh, we'll be updating the Liza Coaching uh, website with camps and information for next year. And um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. John and Coulter, my husband, is going to you know start helping me out a little bit more with the coaching business. So uh, we're really Ooh. looking forward to that. And yeah, we, we want to be on the scene a little bit more with uh, some of the triathlons and very exciting. Yeah, I got to shout out to him. I definitely saw him all over the course and I was like... <laughs> this man has got some sharp skills. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty experienced. Yes, I was super impressed. So, you know, behind every good woman is a strong husband. So. Absolutely. Right, Mike? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, this is us signing off. Uh, this is the race recap with Big Mike and the Pixie. Thank you so much, Liza, for joining us for our very first episode. We're so thankful to have you. So thank you. I love it. You are very welcome. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop the recording. Don't end the meeting.